Hello and uh, welcome to my channel once again. Um, in my previous videos, I have discussed such aspects of um, autosnographic writing as symbiotic approach, data collection, data analysis. So, um, following your multiple requests, in this video I will be answering just one of your questions, and that is related to addressing ethical issues in autoethnography. Uh, here I will present an argument that autoethnographic uh, writing requires a more symbiotic approach to ethics, which has a central focus on the importance of almost destabilizing privileged positions of researchers in relation to the other, as well as the dangers of appropriating what Patty Leather mentions as the lives of others into consumption. So I will discuss here a symbiotic approach to the issues of ethics and also try to suggest some practical strategies to help autoethnographic researchers address some of the key ethical challenges. Now, ethical considerations present continuous concern for autoethnographers as well as other researchers across various fields permeating almost every aspect of their research studies from the moment of conception through to their completion and even beyond. So as in the case of uh, symbiotic approach in general, in this video I'm not intending to provide a recipe that will resolve all your ethical quandaries and issues in all autoethnographic contexts and uh, Neither uh, am I intending to delve into a kind of more detailed discussion about the philosophy of ethics, as this will shift the focus of this video well outside its intended scope. However, um, I have to mention that autoethnographic ethics in symbiotic autoethnography cannot be separated from specific historical social political and cultural context in which the research takes place. Since the concept of ethics is by and large concerned with questions related to human systems of beliefs of what's right and what's wrong, it's unquestionable that these beliefs are shaped by specific historical conditions, cultural practices, social norms, religious influences, and various societal power structures. Profusion of variations and constant shifts in human systems of beliefs make associated ethics codes ambiguous, make them fuzzy, resulting in difficulties for researchers, and particularly for us autoethnographers, in making judgments about the ethical, um, sorry, the ethicality of our research. So, on this slide, on this diagram, I am, um, I have attempted to represent all aspects of um, autoethnographic ethics as I see it in the context of symbiotic autoethnography. Throughout this video, I will explain in more detail each of the identified features. And I think we need to start with uh, procedural ethics. Despite the ambiguity of um, ethics criteria in the field of um, autoethnographic research, autoethnographers, like any qualitative researchers conducting studies that involve humans, are required to meet the guidelines of specific research criteria. And uh, these are associated with research ethics committees, and uh, they have particular institutions, country, sorry, across particular institutions, countries, and cultures. And the role of these committees is to review researchers' applications for ethical approval and ensure that um, the research processes that we carry out are duly attended to. We categorize these formal processes as procedural ethics that involve researchers' engagement with 
such issues, such as, for example, participant um, informed consent, uh, the right to withdraw, co confidentiality, deception, and protecting participants from harm. Interestingly, Denzin um, makes a specific point in relation to ethnographic research, arguing that institutional research ethics committees assume that one model of research fits all forms of inquiry, presuming almost a static, monolithic view of the human subject. This position um, firm, uh, gains firm traction in the concept of a symbiotic approach to ethics, as it is based on a symbiotic interconnection between procedural, procedural framing of ethics and what I call the embodied ethics, which I define as a fusion of situated, situational, relational, and reflexive ethical judgments. So four aspects that autoethnographers face throughout their research process. So while procedural research ethics is broadly concerned with the adherence of research to institutional codes of research practices, embodied ethics is specifically concerned with this interaction between various formal aspects of research ethics and our embodied judgments of the autoethnographer and the other. And just to remind you, when I say the author, I mean participants, story characters, and your readers as well. So let us have a closer look at each of the facets of the embodied ethics out of these four that I mentioned, starting with situated ethics. Now, in symbiotic autoethnography, the complexities related to autoethnographic ethics uh, cut across all its seven features, highlighting once again the impossibility of offering a criteria-based set of guidelines for resolving all ethical issues in all socio-cultural contexts. Instead, uh, one of the key tenets of symbiotic approach to ethics is based on the acknowledgement of the uniqueness of every ethical dilemma, calling for individual approach and situated ethics considerations for all those involved in research. <clears throat> Pardon me. So in the context of um, embodied ethics, situated ethics are understood as autoethnographers' ethical decisions associated with and drawn from particular spatiotemporal localities situated in the context of cultural phenomena under study. So in the context of symbiotic approach, possible ways of addressing situated ethics derive from the embodied nature of our autoethnographic stories. These embodied interactions of autoethnographers with specific cultural and socio-political context essentially shape their ethical considerations, requiring us as researchers amplify the tension to the ways this context influences the process of writing. And reflecting explicitly on these aspects within the documentation accompanying procedural ethics would help us to create a stronger nexus between the requirements of research ethics committees and the researchers embodied situated ethics. For example, um, in my ethics applications for my autoethnographic research about educational leadership in Soviet and neoliberal context, I made explicit references to the potential influences of my embodied Soviet experiences on the research process and my interactions with the participants. At the same time, to strengthen the links to procedural ethics, I also aligned my ethical considerations with the relevant ethical standards 
which in my case were associated with BRA, British Ethical Research Association guidelines, emphasizing the point that certain guidelines may not be appropriate to all circumstances. In particular, different cultural contexts are likely to require situated, situated, my emphasis here, judgments. But this is the quote from Beer, actually. So furthermore, I also included in my Essex application my deliberations on the temporality of my autosnographic writing. And thus, the spatio-temporal nature of ethical decisions made is in, in, in the moment of writing. I make reference to this um, phrase in my previous videos. So indeed, even though we focus on embodied situated ethics, um, it is on the continuity of the reflexive process which requires particular space and time. This means that the ethical decisions which were considered appropriate at the moment of writing might be perceived as wrong at a later point in time. So um, that's really very briefly about situated ethics. And let's move on now to situational ethics. Now, situational ethics um, is considered to be another aspect of embodied ethics in the context of symbiotic approach. The concept seems to be often used almost interchangeably with situated ethics, and yet these two concepts are quite different. As I previously mentioned, situated ethics deals with ethical issues related to specific physical, or in the case of symbiotic approach, or the physical and spatio-temporal contexts. In contrast, situational ethics, as the name suggests, deals with ethical issues arising from different research situations. Where commonly accepted ethical standards are considered less important, than the outcome of a particular situation. And some of the um, most popular examples of situational ethics are related to such scenarios as euthanasia, for example, or abortion, or um, the issues related to conjoined twins, murders. And that's just to name just a few. So similar to embodied situated ethics, situational research ethics goes against the grain of criteria-based approaches that rely on, um, should I say, universalizing ethical norms without taking into consideration researchers' embodied ethical agency. And yet, neglecting embodied nature of ethics leads to its impoverished status, which loses its capacity for flexibility as it becomes blind to empathetic and caring relations experienced through the body. Throwing on these uh, reflections, I suggest that um, situational ethics as part of embodied ethical practices is understood as a dynamic symbiotic interaction between the researcher's bodily responses to different ethical situations and socio-cultural circumstances in which the situations take place. So in this sense, situational ethics cannot be separated from situated ethics, since any ethical dilemma is embedded in specific socio-cultural context. But I'll, I'll give an example um, from my own research practice. When I was carrying out an online uh, interview with one of my participants, her parents overheard our discussion and decided to join the conversation. I was aware at that point that it was against the procedural requirement to gain a written consent from all participants prior to the interview. However, Using my intuitive situational ethics, I continued the interview as I found it inappropriate to ask the participants' parents to leave. Um, so instead, I asked the participant 
on the spot where she was comfortable with um, carrying out with the interview. So as a result, I was provided with new valuable insights into the issues of Soviet leadership since the parents actually appeared to have more experience of this phenomenon than the participant herself. And at a later stage, I shared my transcripts of the interviews with both the participant and her parents. However, should I have followed procedural ethics at the time of the interview, that valuable data would have been lost. Uh, thus, in situational ethics, autoethnographer reflexivity becomes paramount as finding a balance between the requirements of procedural ethics and embodied ethics of a particular situation which requires a genuinely reflexive approach. So, um, now that I mentioned reflexivity, I think we will discuss reflex reflexivity as part of uh, the ethical process. And the importance of uh, autoethnographers' reflexivity has been highlighted in literature across different disciplines by a number of authors. And whilst we, the need for reflexivity permeates all aspects of um, autoethnographic research, when it comes to ethics, the researchers, what I call embodied reflexivity, becomes the ethical pivot around which all spontaneous ethical decisions are centered in relations especially to the situations that fall outside the rules of procedural ethics. So in the attempt to bridge the gap between procedural and situational ethics, autoethnographers might want to make it explicit, once again, important, always make it explicit, in your ethics applications that you are aware of potential unpredictability of ethical situation. At the same time, it is worth acknowledging the need for heightened levels of reflexivity in dealing with the situation, as well as the researcher's ability and preparedness to conduct research with integrity which means really exercising your intellectual honesty, fairness, transparency, and high sensitivity to the issues of uh, social justice, power imbalance, and also conflict of interests. Um, so autoethnographic modes of inquiry um, aimed at moving away from the idea of one objective truth to a subjective narrative truth resulted in more incongruences between embodied and procedural ethics, as you could see from um, the discussion that we just had. These ethical intricacies are embraced by the notion of relational ethics and are generally related to engaging with and representing the other in autoethnographic research. Indeed, most qualitative research where participants, um, uh, participants' identities are anonymized, autoethnographers typically use their own name in publishing the research, which makes it difficult and sometimes impossible to protect the anonymity of others mentioned in the story. Uh, a really dense theoretical antagonism towards these possibilities of conducting autoethnographic study ethically has naturally affected my own thinking behind this symbiotic approach. So um, in the context of embodied ethics, relational ethics um, are symbiotically connected to situated and situational ethics. As autoethnographers' relations with the other are always influenced by these dynamics of the researcher's spatiotemporal bodily responses to different ethical situations taking place in different um, and specific social cultural circumstances. And indeed, our relations with the characters from our autoethnographic stories and with our participants are always in a way embodied 
um, in the sense that they are always shaped by and within our bodies that carry sensory and emotive experiences brought about through our encounters with the other. And yet, um, this embodied, embodied relational ethics, researchers' ethical decisions are not informed only by their bodily intuitive reactions to ethical situations, but also capture wider social implications of these decisions, adding another link to the symbiotic connection between auto, ethno, and graphy. We never forget ethno within our writing, and that includes also our ethical considerations. Through such symbiosis, the notion of relational ethics goes beyond the researcher and the other dichotomy, bringing into focus socio-cultural dimensions of these relations. So thus, in symbiotic approach, relational ethics are understood as an integral part of embodied ethics, with a focus on autoethnographers' heightened reflexive attention to the ways the other is represented in their narratives in relation to both the researcher and the sociocultural dimensions of the study. So what practical steps can autoethnographers take in the process of justifying their ethical choices in symbiotic autoethnography in relation to representing the other? Now let's think uh, first about the informed consent. This issue, of course, is less problematic when researchers work with the data acquired through their relations with the participants where participant stories represented by the researcher go through a process known um, in some countries probably as member checking or in others as participant verification or respondent validation and that is expected to authenticate the participant's voice. And yet how narrative researchers tell the stories of their participants is not unproblematic since the notion of authenticity implies that a single true, well, true is inverted commas, representation is achievable. In the context of symbiotic approach, one of the ways forward is seen in the implicit acknowledgement of the researcher's embodied subjective position in their autoethnographic stories. Just write this into your ethics applications that all your opinions are subjective and they are an attempt to capture the continuous lived flow of historically situated experience with all the ambiguity and uniqueness that such experiences imply. Indeed, even though we implicate other people in our stories, our narrative represents not uh, of one single truth in this traditional sense, but our embodied feelings, our emotional reactions, our subjective opinions captured in the moment of writing. So, in a way, when you write about them, you write about yourself. From this perspective, our narratives represent our narrative truths that might not be necessarily perceived in the same way by other people, including the characters of your stories. Um, moreover, autoethnographers themselves might not even perceive these relations and events in the same way um, at different times and in different circumstances as our autoethnographic auto experiences, um, they are also spatio-temporal. Uh, we might write about our childhood, describing our relationship with our parents, and yet these descriptions are unlikely to be the same um, as our parents would remember them, or they might not be the same few years after you've written them. So again, Acknowledging explicitly the subjectivity and temporality of representing the other 
would allow autoethnographers not only to minimize the gap between procedural and embodied ethics, but also uh, reduce the tensions associated with what Leza, I mentioned that before, called appropriating the lives of others. Um, some of the strategies that might help uh, you to resolve some of the, of the ethical uh, challenges involved, for example, writing in third person, using fictionalization, for example, changing the name, gender, the circumstances around the event you describe, using pseudonyms, creating composite characters, um, engaging in polyvocal narratives, and I discuss all of this in my book. I simply don't want these videos to last forever. Therefore, if you want to learn about this more, either read the book or text me and message me, and I will do another video about these types of um, strategies. So generally, addressing ethical issues in autoethnography is one of the most challenging aspects of autoethnographic research process. And though we try to avoid as much as possible what we call violent textual strategies, we have to recognize that our attempts cannot claim what Juan de Pilo mentioned as um, the innocence of success. So all we can do is to continue to approach the voices of the other in our stories in a sensitive, ethically vigilant, uh, appreciative way, whilst also explicitly acknowledging these efforts in our ethics applications. And yet uh, we can expect that the exploration of ethical solution associated with autoethnographic research will continue and it will continue to stimulate further debates and hopefully yield some new insights and solutions. So um, that's all I want to talk to you about uh, within this uh, video. And please keep sending me your comments and questions, and I will try to respond to them in my next video. And as always, for more information on autoethnography, click subscribe button and also join me on Twitter. Um, thank you very much for your attention and uh, if you want me to create any other videos based on your requests, please text me, message me or comment on the videos on YouTube. Thank you very much and good luck with your autoethnographic research. Goodbye.